Today is the 25th of July, 2012, and we are interviewing at the Armory Building in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, Dwayne Currington is 70 years old, having been born on the 29th of December, 1941. My name is Rachel Park, and I will be the interviewer. Dwayne, could you state for the record what war and branch of service you were in? Uh, I was Vietnam. I was in the 9th Infantry Division, 9th MP Company. Uh, what was your rank? Uh, Sergeant E-5. Where, and where did you serve? I served uh, in 66 through 68. And um, where did you serve? Uh, I was in Vietnam for 15 months uh, in the Mekong Delta. What was your job or assignment? Uh, many jobs. Uh, I was traffic accident investigator for the 9th Infantry Division. I ran convoys uh, for the 9th Infantry Division. Went on uh, search and capture missions for the 9th Infantry Division. Uh, ran a lot of different, uh, lot of different odds and ends we did, mm -hmm. supporting the infantry. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Uh, two Army Accommodation Medals. Um, what did you receive them for? Uh, one was for saving uh, American lives, and the other one, although it doesn't read that way, and the other one for saving Vietnamese lives. Do you mind if I put these in front of the camera so they can see them? No. Let's see if that works. Those are just copies of the original. Yeah. I don't know if you'll be able to read that. I don't know if they'll be able to see that or not. Thank you. So, um, how did you get along with the other officers and fellow soldiers? With most of the officers, fine. Some I didn't. But. Some not. <laughs> Do you have any stories? I had a problem with a lieutenant. Oh, really? <laughs> um, did you ever feel any stress or anxiety while you were there? <laughs> well, I guess so, yeah. I believe, I believe yes. I have to answer yes to that. Was there a particular situation that was particularly stressful? Well, uh, you know, every night. Uh, you'd get pounded in mortar fire, oh, wow. and uh, it gets on your nerves after a while. And then the Viet Cong, uh, they come on base all the time, and they were Viet Cong. Uh, they were Vietnamese when they came on base, civilians. But you knew they were Viet Cong, a lot of them. And they filled sandbags and did this and that and the other thing. You were around them all day long. And then one of my jobs, uh, I'd go into villages and uh, capture Viet Cong catch them sleeping in there and bring them out, take them back for interrogation. Mm -hmm. That gets on your nerves after a while. Was there a particular day or anything that was stressful or memorable in any way? Probably the one uh, Army Accommodation Medal when we uh, went into the village. And uh, there was 10 of us in peace. It was a voluntary thing. We'd go into villages over the morning. Right at the sun up in the infantry to sit down around the village and do the helicopters so nobody could get out. And we'd go in looking for Viet Cong that was sleeping in there overnight and capture them and bring them out. And uh, sometimes it got a little stressful. <laughs> I can imagine. Do you, um, did you keep a diary or anything like No, you I didn't. Uh, no. Would, you, would you have had the means to if you wanted to? Uh, probably, yeah. 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 I'd write home uh, probably a couple of times a week. I'd start a letter and may write, write on it for two or three days before I get it done. <laughs> Just odd times and that. You didn't sleep much of a night time because mm -hmm. you get hit every night. But uh, uh, you'd just write letters back home. And at that time, uh, we could go down and buy a tape on the base camp, a uh, tape recorder, and you could send home a little there's tapes, of course, that time there's a lot of different tapes now. <laughs> we could send them home uh, free of charge. Oh, that's nice. but, uh, so I did some taping and had to send them home to one. Was it easy to get mail while you were there as well? Oh, uh, yeah, when you got back to base camp, I wasn't always at base camp, but when you got back to base camp, the mail was waiting on you. Um, so, did you have or do anything special for good luck? Good luck. Superstitious, you mean? Yeah. No, I'm no. not superstitious. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in God. He's my luck. If I'm going to make it, it's because of him. If I don't, yeah, then he wants me. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. <laughs> so when you were there, did you have um, supplies, plenty of supplies, or was it No, uh, not always. Um, 
we had a C-130 that would come in and drop all supplies. It never sat down on the ground. You shot them out the back on skids and what was left we got. But uh, we we used C rations. Uh, base camp, you, we had a cafeteria, if you wanted to call it that. But I'd rather <laughs> eat C rations. But anyway, we were out in the field where we were, or at compounds. I was a small compound, 10 in, as one dome camp, 10 in most of the time. And uh, we eat C rations. And generally, we had, we had no. Uh, did you ever sample the local cuisine when you were there? Ever what? No. Uh, everything was all Clemens because of Viet Cong. You, know. you didn't know who was in the place. You know, you walk in the people of Viet Cong. No, not really. Uh, I had I have eaten snake over there, uh, and I ate uh, some buffalo over there, and that was probably the best meals that I had while I was over there. Snake tastes a lot like chicken. Everything tastes buffalo like. Buffalo tastes like buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever buffalo tastes like. So how did you entertain yourself while you were there? What's that? How did you entertain yourself while you were there? We were busy. We really? were busy seven days a week. We never had a day off. Uh, wow. And some days were very, very long days. Uh, uh, I had one day that lasted over two days. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, no, it wasn't anything about entertainment. You stay, you were busy all the time doing one thing or another. Because I heard that sometimes they brought entertainers in to base camp. Uh, no, uh, except for Christmas Day of 67, uh, Bob Hope was on our base camp. And, uh, I was bodyguard for Phyllis Diller. I was also, while they were having conferences over there and peace talking uh, conferences, I was a bodyguard for Robert McNamara for 24 hour, 21 day. Other than that, no. we were, we were very, I mean, we were, I was out on the road all the time or doing this or doing that, running a lot of convoys or doing something in the daytime, you know, in the nighttime you're in bunkers and, and it's just, the time flew by, it really did. It went by fast. Did you bring any other photos with you? No, no, I never brought a photo, nothing. Nothing did I bring back with me. Did you um, have any other stories that you wanted to tell us about? So topic. I've got to write up here on some things. I don't know. Uh, I, had a lot of things. I had a lot of things happen uh, while I was over there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know in particular. We had, uh, I was drafted in the Army. Uh, I was living in Canada. I was working up there for a construction company, and a lot of people was going to Canada to get out of the draft. And uh, I came back, of course, going on red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. And I went in on uh, all September 29th, on October 29th, one month later of the day, I uh, married five years. I was 24 years old when I went in with these 18 year old kids. Uh, took my basic at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for jungle warfare training. Uh, trained down there on mortars, uh, 50 caliber machine guns, 45s. And we had the M14s down there. When I got to Nam, we had the M16s over there. I got to Vietnam, I was supposed to uh, go to C Company 5th to 60th. Uh, which was a mortar platoon. Uh, the next morning, we got up, got in line to get on the trucks, and they pulled three of us out of line Chuck Larson, George Heil, and myself. Since it's Knight MP Company, I found out later all three of us were the only ones married. Oh. So they pulled us out, which probably it could have saved our lives, which was probably a little better work at, uh, uh, with the MPs. Mm -hmm. But still, you were out on the road all the time. I was, uh, I had a jeep, a gun jeep, which I was always on the road with. Had the grenadier with me and the uh, machine gunner on the uh, 60 M60. Uh, one day was a lot like another. Was a lot like another. You never kept track of days. Was Monday, Sunday, Wednesday, what day of the week it was. It didn't make any difference because the war is going on. Day of the week don't mean a thing. Uh, had a traffic accident. Uh, which a three-quarter ton hit a thing, a little vehicle called a Lambretta, so a three-wheel vehicle. There's 15 people and it, probably holds about six. And they had 15 people crowded on that. Killed uh, 
six of them, ten were wounded. Anyway, we were told about it. I went out to the scene. Uh, I checked all those out that were dead. Couldn't do anything for them, so I first aid to the others. That's what's on my army accommodation item. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called in a dust off helicopter. It came in. It was dark by the time he got in. Picked up the wounded, took him to the hospital. Make a long story short, I couldn't find out who was driving the three-quarter ton. And finally, they told me at the gatehouse, well, we don't check the three-quarter tons that come through that the company of people from Thailand are on base here. They use our vehicles, but we don't check them in or out. So I went down to their compound, and just got dark enough, I turned on my headlights, and I pulled in the motor pool. Headlights reflected off from the three quarter ton of silver paint smeared all over the front of it, chipped off the umbrella. So I asked the motor sergeant, I said, Who is driving that vehicle the night before last night? He couldn't understand that. They said he went and got the company commander. He was a general, brigadier general. Come out there and I told him the story and I was looking for the driver of that vehicle. So he called him out and he asked him, and I knew, I knew I had the right guy when he came out. So we're looking at him. And the journal asked him if he hit those people and killed them. He said, yeah, I did. So he just took out his revolver, put up against his head, and shot him. He looked at me and says, will there be anything else? I said, no, sir. And I left. I took care of that. I hadn't slept two days, but my commanding officer told me I would find out who did it before I went to bed. But that was probably one day that I'll always remember. And he just up and shot him right on the spot. But we capture uh, Viet Cong and bring them in for interrogation. And after interrogation, the war games, the war right up said, we have to turn these prisoners over to the South Vietnamese Army. Well, they didn't want them. So they just up and shoot them around the spot. They didn't want them. They didn't do it. Just like any time I'd park my Jeep and that, the kids would, uh, you had to keep somebody with you. Couldn't leave alone. Five, six, seven year old kids come up and take hand grenades, put rubber bands around them, pull the pen, drop it down in your gas tank. And about two days later, that gas would eat up those rubber bands. Uh, you'd be around the convoy through town of soldiers in the back of trucks, and, that, and they'd stand alongside the road, eight, ten-year-old, twelve-year-old, throwing hand grenades in the back of the trucks. They called us baby killers. <laughs> uh, just the kids you had to put up with. You had to put up with uh, with the civilians, the public, you know, and that. They were, you, you didn't know a Viet Cong from a Vietnamese civilian. I mean, there wasn't any difference which side were they on. You didn't know. It was like a civil war. One brother would be on one side, the other brother on the other side. And it was a 24 hour a day battle everywhere you went. You know, you never knew what was going to happen. They booby trapped. Booby trapped everything you had to watch, everything you did, and everywhere you went, they booby trapped. No particular day, just a bunch of days that things happened. That running a lot of convoys, and uh, they would. Uh, we had a, we run the windshield down during the dry season. During dry season, it ran about 130 degrees, and uh, it was dusty. Now, so we put the windshield down. You could see better with it down. We had a piece of angle iron welded up on front of the jeep because you come to villages, they knew you was coming. They'd stretch a wire across about head high, yeah. and. Uh, Take your head right off, and the angle iron, you'd hear it break the wire when you come through a village. Uh, just things like that. Just get on your nerves after a while because you didn't trust anybody. You didn't know who was on your side or who was on the other side. Uh, a lot of crazy things happened. We had to, you know, down in the Delta, it was uh, rice paddies, and you had six months of rain where it rained one to four inches an hour. 18 to 24 hours a day, seven days a week for six months. Wow. Then for six months, you didn't see a cloud in the sky. During the monsoons, when it rained like that, you get down to about 70 degrees of the nighttime, up to about 100 of the daytime. During the months when there was clear and no sunshine, where I was down south, it was hot down there, it'd run 120 to 130 degrees, get down to about 100 of the nighttime. But uh, you got used to heat. You read it, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as what it sounds. It's a lot hotter here now at 100 than it was there at 130 because I was uh, 40 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just odds and ends, you know, uh, trying to deal with the Vietnamese people. And uh, you didn't know who was on your side, who wasn't. But the nighttime, nobody was on your side. Uh, I don't know. 
just a lot of things happened and a lot of things, a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Saw a fella kiss a cobra one day. We had a lot of cobras over there, mm -hmm. king cobras. Uh, we had a lot of black vipers. They were, we called a three step snake. They bet you took about three steps before you died. The king cobras stand about six foot high. And this one fella said, You can get a king cobra and bring it in here and I'll kiss him. Oh boy, the guy just jumped at this. He wanted to see this. He went out and got a cobra brought him and got him worked up. And this guy did. He walked around behind him and come up and kissed him on the back of the cape. Little snake boy goes down like that. He jumps back, you know. Crazy, but fellow patrolling outside our base camp, uh, there was a runway. It was just a dirt runway, and it, we didn't land planes on it. They come in the C 123s and dump our supplies out the back of all the But every night they'd have a Jeep, two MPs patrolling that runway. Then if they heard somebody coming, come in, they'd radio back and get the heck out of there, give us a little bit of warning. So one night, the two MPs going down the runway, crack, something hit the seat. He said he's bird, and he says, you hear a rifle shot? I said, no. I said, Somebody shot at us. I felt it hit the seat. I said, nobody shot at us. So they're running the blackout lights on. He turns the Jeep around, turns on his headlights, and everybody became Cobra. He still couldn't put things together. Next morning, got back to camp. The sun came up. He had a hunk of leather about that big around out of the seat, but his Cobra struck at him and missed him, hit the seat, missed him about that far. <laughs> you should have seen that fellow. I thought he was going to pass out right on the spot. But the snakes were bad. I was outside this one bunker. Uh, they would have three people in the bunker, two M60s, the 45, and 50 caliber in the middle. And somebody had a stand guard at the back. His BC got through the Constantine wire. They come in the back and throw grenades in the back of the bunker. The guy has been in this bunker for half an hour, 45 minutes. I walks up to him. Big old bull stricter come crawling out of it. And he was probably about 15 foot long. He was probably none of that big around. And he'd been in there all that time, and they were in there, and they never knew it. And I asked him the next point, I said, Did you know that you were in there with a fire, or with a bull constrictor? And they said, no. So how do you know it? I said, he come crawling out. <laughs> I said, that's how I know it. But just crazy things like that have happened. We had a lot of snakes. Scorpions. Scorpions are real bad. You didn't take your boots off at nighttime. They love going down boots where it's dark. So the scorpions are bad and the snakes are bad. But it was a lot of, you know, crazy things. And that's what I'm going to try and remember because in the south, see, the Viet Cong did not have prison camps. They did up north. The NBA did North Vietnam. If they captured you down there, they'd take a soldier and they'd stick him in the ground like uh, the Indians did. They cut his stomach open and pour gasoline inside of him and set him on fire. And that's how he had to die. And so you didn't get captured. Though. They told you, you know, if you want to die that way, go ahead. And I'll take that 45 and blow your brains out. And however you want to do it. But they didn't have prison camps. And they did if they captured you. So things got on your nerves. Yeah. It, 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 I, I can't say I was scared because I believe in God. I believe he's going to take me when it's my time. But you get nervous. Yeah. I was afraid of hurting somebody, getting somebody killed, getting stuff. Because I was a sergeant. A lot of times I was an NCOIC, non-commissioned officer in charge. And I was always worried about getting someone else hurt. Uh, just different things like that. Little things, you know, that get on you after a while. Uh, how much time we got? We walked into this one village. And it was 10 MPs beyond line. Most of the villages are laid out the same. Down each side were the hooches. Now these hooches are what they live in. They're like a little grass shack. That's what they're like. They take this off the grass and they weave it for the roof. It'll rain two to three inches an hour. Won't make a drop. And these people are good. Good dirt floors. Houses down each side are hooches. At the end is always a church. The middle is empty. There was one village walked in. Nothing in the middle, but the elephant grass was probably up to my chest, grow in the middle. And you sure don't see that. Anyway, uh, about 50 meters down, two Viet Cong ran out of the house. Well, they didn't have weapons, so that made them Vietnamese civilians. Mm -hmm. So I said, fire high. Everybody had M16s and automatic. We emptied 20 rounds times 10, 200 rounds in less than two seconds. 
we've shot over the top of us run through this grass. They ran out the other side and Emphrey said they were happier than heck to get captured. After that. <laughs> In front of this church is four banana trees. We just cut them down like somebody took a chainsaw to it. Okay. So we all split up. The first hooch I went into, I saw this table like sitting on the corner, a white tablecloth like, like a sheet, quite to the floor. They don't eat off tables. I wanted them to raise it up. Six 55 gallon drums of JP4 fuel, very high explosive airplane fuel. I said, What on earth? So I called the Colonel. Uh, Colonel always went out with us. Uh, I called him over and showed it to him. We started tearing that place apart. We could find nothing. We never messed with the churches. And I said, Let's go and look at the church. We went to the church and couldn't see anything. And I saw these steps, so I went down to the basement. I didn't walk across the floor in the basement. I walked across the top of 55 gallon drums of high explosive fuel. The basement was full of them. Hundreds and hundreds of gallons. The only place it could have come from is the Saigon docks because it comes in on shifts in 55 gallon drums. Then they dump it, they pump it into these tanks, and these tankers pull underneath it. And they know the tankers when they take it out to your compounds all over the country and base camps. We have fuel biters, rubber fuel biters underground because of the mortar fire every night. That way they can't blow up their fuel. Head to come to Saigon. No place else could come from. So that's why the ARCOM did not read exactly what happened because they didn't want people to know that we don't know what went wrong. But anyway, the chief of the village said that they were using it making booby traps and bombs, things like that. I never seen something. Thing. But that was one of the things I got in our account for that and saving the Vietnamese lives that night. Uh, I just did a little bit of everything, uh, whatever there was to do, I do. Volunteered. I volunteered for everything. They said, Don't volunteer in the military. I had these 18 year old kids in there and I was 25. Some of these kids had never been off the farm. I mean, they were terrified all the time. I wasn't, and nobody liked going with me. Nobody liked. I had a one gr a grenadier that went with me and one machine gunner, and I couldn't get any others to go. They were, they didn't like being with me yeah. because I wasn't scared, and yeah. they were afraid of me getting them in trouble. And that's one thing I didn't want to do is get anybody in trouble. So, uh, but I did have this one guy, uh, Bob Schubert from uh, 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 Oregon, with me, and then the other fella, don't know where he's from. It's Schubert. I talked to him. He's trying to locate him. He thinks he's out on the east coast. The three of us used to run the gun chief all the time, run all the convoys and that together. But uh, I was older than the rest of them. Out, out at, uh, I got along with everybody except out at uh, this one Tan Ann area where I stayed. We had a lieutenant, a second lieutenant, just got out of school and he knew it all and anything he could tell him. And then there was an E6 and then I was an E5 and the rest were respect boards or PFCs. And, uh, if he wanted me to know something, he'd tell these six, these six to tell me. <laughs> he wouldn't even talk to me after a while. Oh, he was just a smart ass. <laughs> One day he called him lieutenant. He'd say, you call me sir. The next day he called him sir. He'd say, you call me lieutenant. You know, he's just a smart mouth guy. I don't know if he made a back or not. Somebody on our side might have shot him. There was a lot of people that were shot by our own people. You didn't want to make too many enemies over it. <laughs> During the gun battle, they don't look at what way that bullet would have come out in the front of the back. <coughs> That's war. <coughs> Anything else you need to know? Did you, um, were you able to keep in contact with these people that you? Uh, yeah, Schuber, uh, John Schuber out in uh, Albany, Oregon. Uh, I, I talked to him about every year at Christmas time. I got his number on my phone now. Uh, I, I contact him maybe once, twice a year. Uh, I, there's a fellow up in Algoma, Wisconsin, almost up to Door County, that I talked to at Christmas time. And then the fellow that kissed the snake, I haven't seen him since about 19. We, we came back 60, about 72, I saw him. Uh, Leo C. Audino, what do I tell you? Uh, you know, in Ohio, but I haven't seen him since the early 70s. Other than that, I haven't contacted or seen anybody. I didn't know a lot of them. I'd be here for a week maybe, then I'd be there for maybe a week, you know, different people, yeah. different people. So I never really got to know anybody. And you don't, you don't make friends. Uh, it don't work out. It don't work at all. There wasn't a one of those 18-year-old boys that I wouldn't trust my life with that back you up.
I told the wife when I came home and I went to work down here at Bridgestone Firestone, I worked down there 35 years. I went home one day and told the wife, I said, I was in Vietnam, these 18 year old men, and now I have to work these 40, 50 year old adolescents. I said, it's really hard for me to accept these guys as being men now, the way they whine and cry and carry on. It was hot in that plant down there, it was hot. But boy, they made 25 dollars an hour. I said, well, I said, you don't like it here? I said, McDonald's hiring this air conditioner. Oh, they get mad. Oh, they get mad at me for saying <laughs> But the, these guys in the, in the military were good people. Some of them were drafted like me, some enlisted, but never heard too many complaints about things. Because uh, what, 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 you know, what could you, what could you do about it? Like I told an officer one day, if I screwed up, what are you going to do? Send me to Vietnam. Well, he got mad at me for saying that. You know? <laughs> But uh, I used to agitate officers, so I didn't the colonel because he was a hell of a good man, but I used to agitate some of the lieutenants and one captain, I used to agitate him. Oh, he get mad at me. <laughs> it was all in fun and they knew it. But yeah, I wouldn't make it mad sometimes for some of the things I'd do and say. He told me one day, he said, Currington, do you ever do anything for the book? I said, I've never read the book. You know, things like that. <laughs> No, I cannot say I had a good time. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I went. I'm glad I served. Uh, it took me. I worked the war museum in Pontiac with these World War II Korean veterans. Now. You don't see any Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. Vietnam veterans come home, crawled underneath the rug, and stayed there. Mm -hmm. For 20 years, I had a rough time. I had a hard time. For the first 20 years, I was back home, I think. Uh, but then I told myself, I said, I can't live like this. I cannot. It's over with. It's in the past. Forget it. But you can't forget it. And then uh, when I started going up to the War Museum and helping out up there, I saw other soldiers went through as much as I did or more. And uh, it helped me. It helped me out a lot. Mm -hmm. Just being with them, sitting around, tell, we, we always say, which one of us is going to tell the biggest lie today? They weren't lies, but we told stories about the military and things like that. This one fellow sitting there talking to another guy. I took a hand grenade out and pulled a pin through it to him. Well, he took that and there was nobody around him. And that's why he did. Well, he took that thing through and she went off. Boy, he was one mad son. <laughs> then I would have been too if somebody had done that to me. You got three to five seconds once that handle comes out of there. Oh, just crazy stuff like that people would do over there. We was riding along one day around the convoy, and the machine gunner opened up, and I said, where at, what did you say? Oh, he said, nothing, he said, shooting through the birds on the high line wires. You know, just crazy stuff like that. Just scare that guy. Uh, and uh, we, you know, entertainment, we entertained ourselves, and that, you know, set around doing different things, and that. Uh, we would have a, this bunker, uh, we fixed up, so we had a bar in it, it was, it wasn't as long as this table, and uh, it wasn't nearly this wide. And when I go to Saigon on convoys, I take a trailer on, I buy beer for two forty a case, ten cents a can, and pop, and bring it back. Hot, my God, hot. So somebody's going to inspect our area one day. You don't inspect areas in Vietnam. I know, but I don't know who, who. Some officer got wild idea. We found these fire extinguishers were all empty. How come he was empty? Well, I saw the guys pulled the beer off and he said, who to extinguish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just crazy stuff like that that went on. You know. So, uh, but we buy it for uh, a dime a can, and so they charge a soldier 15 cents a can. They make five cents. And then they would buy different things and that, you know, oh, you needed this, you needed that. And they go to PX and they back at base camp, buy stuff for you, pencils or stuff like this, and give to you. And then, uh, Writing paper or something like that. They'd make a nickel again. Just crazy things we used to do. You know, we used to, although one fella, and it wasn't very funny, and that was never done again. This black kid was scared to death of snakes, and they killed his cobra. And they brought it in, and he was in his bunk one night and threw it on him. And that was never done again. But uh, boy, this kid might die. If he'd had a gun, he'd killed him. They won't give you ammunition on him on the base camp, uh, out at the outposts, we always carried ammunition. If you get hit any time base camp, they wouldn't even have to go check it out. Mm -hmm. If you get hit at night time in, that, in the bunkers and you go in there, ammunition was in there, everybody would have it. But there was kids on drugs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
this one kid who came out in the company area and this is on base camp, just sprayed it down M16. His buddy ran out there and told him to put the damn gun down. He said, lay it down. He said, you got to kill somebody. And he went out and he grabbed the barrel of it. He pulled the trigger and just opened him up like a big can. Now, he's got to live with that the rest of his life. He killed his best friend, you know. There was drugs over there. They'd take cigarettes out of the daytime. The mama saw him out at one of the villages and she'd fill with opium. And they'd pick him up at nighttime and they'd come back in. A lot of drugs went on over there. A lot of, a lot of guys got killed because of it. Fellow was outside the base one night. You're not outside a base camp at night, or compounds. You are not outside at night time. You're gonna get killed. This guy had him a girlfriend out in the village. I don't know how you have a girlfriend. Those filthy people. I mean, this was this wasn't uptown type stuff. This was out. And he come back in one night. Gonna come through the gate. Boy, they opened up on him. And they next morning they went out there and found him. They said, yeah, we killed him. It was his own fault. Nobody else has nothing said about it after that. I think they sent home a Purple Heart, uh, which they didn't have to, to his parents saying he was killed in action. Uh, a lot of things had done that shouldn't have been done. Uh, there was a lot of things we did because I think of stress and that. Uh, we got a lot of bad write-ups. I don't read a newspaper today. And I haven't since uh, 67 when I went to Nam. I read about us being baby killers. When I read some of the crap they wrote in newspapers that were was not true. Uh, Lieutenant Kelly did kill a bunch of people in the village. That's true. But according to newspapers, everybody was doing that. I never knew it to be done other than him. He fell off the world that day and just went bananas, went crazy. <coughs> But uh, that can happen. That can happen to you uh, because your nerves, which is, I call it nerves. I don't call it being scared. It's just your nerves all the time because it's a 24 hour a day. Watch your back. You never know when somebody's going to step around the corner of your tent and throw. We stayed in tents at the night time, throw a grenade in there or something, you know, because we didn't know what some of the BC that or Vietnamese civilians in there side and filling sandbags for you in the daytime or cutting your hair on the base camp we had barbers, Vietnamese barbers. Most of them would be a call. Yeah. We didn't know what some of them might have stayed on base and on left that night and hid somewhere, you know. Yeah. <coughs> it was no fun. We tried to make fun out of things, but it was no fun. Rain, oh god it rained. Pulled up to the gatehouse down Dalton Town. And uh there was no gatehouse there. I said, oh, two MPs stand up here soaking wet. And it's raining. I had to top up on my jeep and I didn't have my gun on it. And uh, so he, where's your gatehouse? Captain won't let us build one. Why? He said, we had an M79 or M79 round, yeah, which is a grenade launcher. And then it's got a round that fits in. It's about that long, about that big round. It looks like a big bullet. And it, Fired like a grenade. And <clears throat> after 30 revolutions, it's armed. So you can drop it or anything, it's not going to blow up after it leaves the weapon. So we didn't have anything to do. He's out here playing catch. We used to play catch with it all the time. Well, evidently they armed it. <laughs> so we laid it up on the shelf. And there. So we were standing out here one day and evidently it rolled off the shelf and just blew the gatehouse all to pieces. <laughs> the captain found out about it, he wouldn't let us build another one. <laughs> so we got to stand out in the rain. Now, I don't know if that was true or not, but that's what they told me. And I can believe it. I can believe it. But there wasn't much, you know, there wasn't much to do. And uh, I was busy. I was lucky. I was busy. A lot of guys weren't as busy as what I was. And a lot of them got in trouble, too, doing silly stuff, you know. That uh, I was there for 15 months. I was there my 12 months and getting ready to come back home. I said, where am I going? They said, Fort Dix, New Jersey, you got to train on mortars. I said, I don't want to train these kids on mortars. They don't want to be in the military. I said, what do you do to get out of it? I said, you have to extend for three months over here. And then you get in there. I said, okay, I'll extend for three months. So I did. My wife was not very happy with me that I extended for three months. I don't know. I don't have too much else to say. I could talk forever and never do it. There's so many things. Uh, I got a write up. Do you want it or do you want to just use this? We'll you? use this for this and yeah. then maybe okay. we'll use your write up for something okay. else too. But okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Just to nope. Nope. That's not. <laughs> Thank you so much. For your okay.